Uh, thanks, Stuart Holm, for joining us this hour. Happy to have you with us. Uh, so he was 19 years old. His name was Michael Donald. Uh, he was an Alabaman. He lived in Mobile, Alabama. And one night in April 1981, 19-year-old Michael Donald was set upon uh, for no reason at all. He was ambushed and attacked. He was beaten and strangled. He was killed. He was then hanged from a tree. Uh, one of the men who attacked Michael Donald that night in Alabama would later admit in court that that teenager, Mr. Donald, uh, had done nothing whatsoever to attract the attention of his attackers. They did not pick on him for any particular reason other than the fact that he was convenient and he was a young black man. He was attacked and he was killed and his body was put on display the way it was, specifically because he was a random victim. All the more terrifying that way, right? It's because the Klan, the Ku Klux Klan in that part of Alabama, wanted to show their strength. They wanted to show what they were capable of. And one of the attackers, one of the Klan members who took part in that murder, he would explain later in court that he and his co-conspirators uh, were specifically hoping that this murder would not just generically terrify African Americans in Mobile, Alabama. He, they were hoping it would specifically intimidate African Americans into not participating on juries. They wanted black Americans in Alabama to be too afraid to show up at the courthouse and sit for jury duty. They wanted all white juries in Alabama. They thought that killing 19-year-old Michael Donald would be a good way to terrorize the black community in Alabama into achieving that, or at least getting part of the way there. One of the Klansmen who confessed to that murder, uh, the one who confessed to why they did it, who actually expressed remorse in court, he told Michael Donald's mother eye to eye in that courtroom, quote, God knows if I could trade places with him, I would. He tearfully expressed remorse to Michael Donald's mother in, courtroom, in the courtroom. He testified against the other Klansmen. He explained why they did it. He described the crime to the jury. He nevertheless himself got a life sentence in that killing. One of his co-conspirators, another man convicted in the killing, got the death penalty. But beyond that criminal case that put those Klansmen away for that murder in Alabama in 1981, Michael Donald's murder also led to a different kind of case um, that became a real landmark in the fight against white supremacist terrorism. It was the first case of its kind, but it wouldn't be the last. In a civil suit brought on behalf of Michael Donald's mother and Michael Donald's family, not just the individual Klansmen who killed Michael Donald, but the organization they belonged to, the Klan itself, their chapter of the Klan was the United Klansmen of America. The defendants were forced by the court to not just face criminal penalties, but they and the organization they belonged to were forced by the court in this civil suit to pay, literally to pay money there was a $7 million judgment handed down by a federal jury in Alabama in 1987. Again, the crime was 1981. It took until 1987 for the criminal cases to be over and then for this civil case to produce this $7 million judgment. $7 million that was to be extracted from the bank accounts, the assets, the garnished wages, the property of the defendants themselves, the killers themselves, and from that united clans group that they belonged to. Now, if this is ringing a distant bell for you, if you think you might have heard about this case, it's probably because one of the unforgettable details, one of the unforgettable consequences from that case is that at the time 19-year-old Michael Donald was murdered, uh, the United Clans of America, the oldest Klan chapter in America, had a headquarters in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. They had a 7,000 square foot national headquarters. They had that headquarters at the time they killed Michael Donald. They still had that headquarters at the time the Klansmen who killed Michael Donald were convicted and sent away, including one of them to death row. But after all of that, after this civil case was brought against the defendants and brought against the Klan itself to make them pay for what they did, not only did they have to pay? Did they have to give up all of their property and all of their money? But the title to that 7,000 square foot National Ku Klux Klan headquarters in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, the title for that property, the ownership of the Klan headquarters, was signed over to Michael Donald's mother, whose name was Beulah May. It made national news at the time. The United Clans of America, the country's oldest group of Ku Klux Klansmen, is threatened with financial ruin. 
That's because of a verdict last night by a jury in Mobile, Alabama, giving $7 million in damages to the family of a black man murdered by members of this group. As NBC's Dan Molina reports, this is a new way of fighting back against the Klan. No comments at all? Leaders of the largest and most secretive of the Ku Klux Klan organizations were not in a talkative mood last night as they left federal court. Robert Sheldon, imperial wizard of the United Clans of America. I don't have any comments. Just move, please, sir. I'm fixing to go home. But anti-Klan groups were jubilant today. I think it's going to hurt them. I think they'll find it more difficult to recruit. I think they probably will lose some members as a result. The crime in question was committed March 21st, 1981. The savagely beaten body of Michael Donald, a 19-year-old black man, was found hanging from a tree. In 1983, Klan member Henry Hayes was sentenced to death for the murder. Another Klansman, James Knowles, received a life sentence. Now, $7 million in damages awarded to Donald's family. Because that was my baby, and nothing they do can bring him back. But I still say I am proud that this came to court. Until now, no Klan group had ever been found liable for the actions of its individual members. And the federal court judgment came from an all-white jury. Uh, We think this verdict sends a very strong message across the country uh, that white southerners, white mobilians, will not tolerate this kind of activity. It's not known if the United Klans has $7 million, but the aim was to dismantle whatever financial base the group has and to establish a precedent that can be used by other victims of Klan violence. The aim was to dismantle whatever financial base the group has and to establish a precedent that can be used by other victims of Klan violence. That case did set a precedent that was used by other victims of Klan violence and other victims of white nationalist, white supremacist, neo-Nazi violence. As I said, it was a landmark case. But that kind of violence is something that never really seems to go away in this country, although boy does it have its peaks and its troughs. Civil rights groups, particularly the Southern Poverty Law Center, which pioneered that technique, Uh, They went on to file a bunch of cases like this, not just against individual criminals that carried out violent attacks because of their white nationalist, white supremacist ideology, but they filed these cases against the groups and the organizers that helped promote this ideology and and spread it and that encouraged its violence. The year after that Alabama case that handed Beulah Mae McDonald, uh, Beulah Mae Donald, the keys to the headquarters of the oldest Klan group in America, the year after that, um, it was a different case. It was a horrific case out of Portland, Oregon. There was a racist skinhead group operating at the time called East Side White Pride in Portland, and three racist skinheads from that group laid in wait uh, one November night, Portland, Oregon, 1988. And they ambushed a 28-year-old man, an immigrant from Ethiopia, named Mulugeta Sarah. Uh, He was on his way home to his apartment. They set upon him. They beat him to death. They split his head open with a bat. All three of those skinheads that committed that murder ended up going to prison for that crime. Obviously, beating somebody to death is a crime, regardless of why you do it. They were all caught. They were all convicted. They were put away. But that's as far as the criminal law was going to take it. That was not, however, the whole story of that crime and why it happened. It emerged that a group called White Aryan Resistance, which was headquartered in California, um, had dispatched its operatives to Portland, Oregon, specifically to try to further radicalize the racist skinheads who were already operating there, to try to incite Portland skinheads to, to further and more extreme random violent attacks for all the reasons that these groups think that violence is so good for their cause, right? I mean, these groups think that violence is so good for them because they find these attacks intrinsically valuable, right? They're white supremacists. They seek to hurt and terrorize and kill their perceived racial and demographic enemies. So they see the attacks themselves as a positive. Further, they hope these attacks will be cathartic. They'll be inspirational to other people who share the same beliefs but haven't yet acted on them by hurting or killing someone. Right? They're always trying to set off wider and wider and more and more terrifying racial murder and violence and terror. The more, the better. Ultimately, finally, they hope they can engender enough violence and terror and murder against, you know, you name it, people of color and, and immigrants and Jews and people they perceive as leftists or anybody else they define as their, their enemy or their target. They ultimately hope to, to cause as much violence and terror and murder against those populations that they inspire inevitable violent backlash because they want it to be a war. They think once the country gets into a full-on whites against everyone race war, they're quite sure they'll win and they'll get their, you know, white homeland or whatever it is they want. 
So in the late 1980s, there's this guy named Tom Metzger, uh, who had inspired lots of violent white supremacist groups. He had mentored several white supremacist murderers over the years. Um, and he and his latest group at the time, White Aryan Resistance, it was run by him and his son, nice family, uh, they decided they would try to put a, a sharper edge, a more violent edge, on the existing racist skinhead movement in the late 80s in Portland, Oregon. And so they sent their guys from White Aryan Resistance up to Portland to try to incite the local racist skinheads up there to further and more radical and more violent action. And when those Portland skinheads then killed Mulugeta Sara outside his apartment building that November night in 1988, the criminals themselves, the skinheads themselves who did it, they were punished by the criminal law. But then there was this lawsuit that was brought not only against them, it was also brought against Tom Metzger and his organization, White Aryan Resistance. And that lawsuit, of course, was, was not a criminal case. It was not going to add criminal charges against Metzger or his group. It didn't add any additional prison time to anybody's sentence. And, of course, it didn't bring back the man they beat to death. But it did put a $12.5 million price on that murder as the cost to be paid by that corner of the white, viol white nationalist terrorist movement. So, I mean, where were these racist thugs and these skinheads and these, you know, Aryan organizers going to get $12.5 million to pay the judgment in that case? Obviously, that's a reasonable question. They were never going to get all the way there. They didn't have that kind of money. But anything they did have, right, their homes, their cars, their bank accounts, their personal property, any donation anyone ever decided to make to white Aryan resistance, any future wages they might earn, all of that now, by court order, would be taken from them and would go instead to the family of that Ethiopian man who those skinheads murdered in the street. White supremacist Tom Metzger got one thing right when he addressed the jury in his own defense. They want me. And that is indeed what they got. Metzger calls himself a TV repairman, but from his base in San Diego, he has run a racist mail order and cable TV business called White Aryan Resistance. Excuse me, ma'am, could I give you a copy of our uh, White Aryan Resistance? The jury in Oregon decided that from San Diego, he encouraged his followers to invade Portland and commit violence. Encouraged three members of his gang to attack and kill an Ethiopian student here on this street with a baseball bat. In the end, the Sarah family of Ethiopia, victimized by skinheads, will receive a portion of Metzger's income and all of his property. And all of his property. After that, vi after that verdict, the father of Mulugeta Sarah told the Associated Press, quote, this is the happiest I feel since my son died because I know he has not died in vain. So th this tactic has a certain elegance to it, right, when it comes to strateg strategizing against ongoing violent terrorist movements in this country, right? Responding after the fact to the individual attackers and murderers who commit these atrocities I mean, it's obviously necessary, but it's a little bit like pouring, waters on the, pour, pouring water on the ashes after the fire's already burned through, right? But if, alternatively, you can bankrupt these organizations that spread and advance this ideology, if you can cripple their ability to receive funds, to own assets, to have headquarters buildings, to pay their bills, to pay for postage, to do whatever it is they need to do in the real world to organize and incite and encourage further attacks, well... That's more proactive, right? That's, you know, getting the matches wet, <laughs> right? That's clearing out the dry brush. That's stopping or, or mitigating the impact of the next fire they might try to set. One of the most famous of these cases resulted in the, I think, very satisfying outcome of this Aryan Nations compound in northern Idaho, in Hayden Lake, Idaho, not only being seized from Aryan Nations after some skinheads from that group beat and shot at a couple of random passersby one night in Idaho in 1998. That land, which was an ongoing gathering place for neo-Nazis for years, ultimately, after one of these cases, that land itself was awarded to the family that was attacked by those skinheads. The family then sold it to a guy who put up sort of a, a museum of tolerance on the site, which must have delighted the Aryan skinhead guys who had been using it as their camp in the woods for years. And that, that was 2000 and 2001, another one of these cases that made national news at the time that put a real spotlight on that hallmark tactic in fighting at least that era 
of white nationalist, white supremacist, violent terrorism in the United States. But, you know, that news footage I was just showing there, you know, it's, it's old looking, right? We're, we're a couple of decades at least down the road from that stuff. And then now it sort of feels like the matches are dry again and the dry brush has grown back, right? When the, when the Aryan nations and white Aryan resistance and the United Clans of America lost their shirts, you know, lost their robes, uh, and their headquarters and their houses and their ability to ever have donations and have their wages garnished and all of that stuff. I mean, surely those kinds of cases and the way those organizations suffered from losing those cases, that surely undercut their organizational capacity, these clan chapters, these skinhead outfits, right? But the ideology hasn't gone away, and their movement has been sustained, and it certainly exists among us right now, and it perceives itself now to have friends in very high places, including in their view, in the White House. The shooter from El Paso this weekend is in custody now after having killed 22 people at least and having apparently uploaded a diatribe online echoing the rhetoric of the president's re-election campaign about a Hispanic invasion at the southern border and repeating lots of other long-standing white supremacist tropes that he says he learned about online. Federal prosecutors have already announced that that El Paso attack will be investigated as a potential act of domestic terrorism, and that killer will be tried because he survived his attack. But in addition to that El Paso case, today in Gilroy, California, the FBI announced that they are looking at potentially the same sort of framing for the Gilroy shooting last weekend, which the shooter did not survive. We have uncovered evidence throughout the course of our investigation that the shooter was exploring violent ideologies. We are striving to find several things. What, if any, ideology he had actually settled on? Who, if anyone, he may have been in contact with regarding these ideologies? Who, if anyone, helped him or had advanced knowledge of his intentions? And why he committed this specific act of violence? Again, in this case, the Gilroy case, the shooter is dead. He reportedly killed himself in the midst of all the carnage that he caused. With him dead, there's nothing at all they can do to him through the criminal law, right? That will change the fact of what he did or how he paid for it. He took his own life. He's beyond the reach of anyone's retribution or accountability. Now, this prospect that law enforcement authorities may try to determine if anybody else was involved, if anybody else knew or helped him, that is an interesting prospect. If he was indeed part of something larger, if he was motivated by, inspired by, encouraged by an ongoing violent terrorist movement. Now, what law enforcement will do about that if they find out the answer is yes will be interesting to see. I don't think there are, broadly speaking, any high hopes that, you know, this federal government, that this Justice Department under William Barr, this Justice Department under President Trump is going to partake a broadly aggressive tack toward this particular type of violent extremism. But it's worth thinking about the tactics here, right? This weekend, it'll be two years since the huge neo-Nazi gathering and the murderous attack in Charlottesville, Virginia, after which President Trump proclaimed there were very fine people on both sides. I went back today and looked at our coverage on this show immediately following the Charlottesville attack. I was struck by the fact that even at the time, it sort of felt like we could have seen Charlottesville coming. Remember, Charlottesville was August of 2017. In the six months before the Charlottesville conflagration, there were a whole bunch of pretty high-profile racist attacks in this country. And even though that was only a couple of years ago, most of them have already been forgotten. But the day after the Charlottesville attack happened here on the show, we ran down some of them just in the six months before Charlottesville. I mean, in February of that year, in Kansas, two Indian engineers were shot in a bar by a guy who screamed racial and religious epithets at them. One of those two engineers was killed. The other was wounded, as was a bystander. The following month, March of that year, Midtown Manhattan, a young white guy from Maryland drives all the way from Maryland to New York City with a sword so he can randomly stab to death a black man on the street who we didn't know from Adam. He thought doing it in New York, in Times Square in New York City, would get him the most attention because he was hoping to set off more random killings of black men in America with his totally unprovoked sidewalk murder. Just weeks later, it was Portland, Oregon, two girls on a commuter train subjected to a torrent of racial and religious abuse and violent threats by a guy on the train, threatening them, screaming at them. Passersby on the train intervened put themselves between the attacker and these girls he was going after, two of those passers-by were killed, another one seriously wounded. That same week, this young man, 
who had just been commissioned as a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army, three days away from his college graduation, was stabbed to death in Maryland by a young white student who was a member of a hardcore right-wing racist online group. That was all right in the lead-up to Charlottesville, Virginia. In the last couple of days, the uh, New York Times did a big list of about a dozen white supremacist attacks that have happened in this country over the past six or seven years. <laughs> I was looking at that list today, actually. None of the events that I just described that happened in the six months before Charlottesville even made this list from the New York Times, for whatever reason. I mean, I'm not faulting the Times for that. I'm just saying there's been a lot of them in recent years, kind of even hard to track, even just over the last couple of years. And to the extent that this is not random stuff, to the extent that these are not, you know, bad apples, to the extent that this is the manifestation of an organized white nationalist movement in this country that seeks violence, that is deliberately trying to inspire and encourage and enable racially motivated and anti-Semitic attacks and any other kind of attack that would advance the cause of white nationalism or bring about their fabled race war. I mean, if you are worried that the federal government, that this federal government at this time may not be inclined to do enough about that, that they may treat all of these things as if they're individual crimes, all committed in isolation, just a few bad apples, nothing connecting them. If that is a realistic downside risk of having this president at the head of the federal government at this time, well then, aren't we back to a question that was first called a few decades ago? Can the victims of these crimes and their families play a part in shutting down this terrorist movement in a way that the federal government may not be able or willing to do? Can the victims do it? Can the victims and their families bankrupt these organizations and these organizing hubs, right? Is it possible strategically to organizationally decapitate these organizations and these hubs that facilitate this kind of terrorism in America? Can you organizationally decapitate them even when law enforcement will not? Hold that thought. Live question. Stay with us. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.